Each movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is special in its own way, but there are some things which most of them have in common. Today we'll take a look at the library of Marvel titles and check out some interesting patterns. DC may disguise their heroes with suits and glasses, but we'll show you the comical Marvel Civilian Starter Pack, as well as what makes a great villain, and even reveal what every Phase 2 movie has in common. You've probably heard of anti-heroes before, but the MCU is much better known for its plethora of anti-villains. These are characters who oppose the heroes, but they do make some good points. They're also sympathetic to audiences, and you might have found yourself rooting for them at some point. One frequent criticism of the MCU is that its villains can be one-dimensional, so the trend of these characters is a welcome change of pace, and one we hope to see continue. Of course, there's the original anti-villain Loki, who we see frequently struggling with feelings of inadequacy and wanting to earn his father's approval. Then we have Eric Killmonger, who frankly had some good points, although we don't approve of the violent means he was willing to use in order to achieve his goals. Wanda and Pietro started out as villains because they were understandably upset at Tony Stark for creating the shells that destroyed their homes. Thanos commits horrific acts, but he also believes he's doing the right thing and that his actions will ultimately limit suffering. In Ant-Man and the Wasp, we have Ghost, who does bad things in an effort to relieve her constant agony and prolong her life. It's not hard to see why many of these anti-villains gradually become heroes. It's the redemption arc, folks! When Marvel Studios first started making movies, many fans believed each movie took place in the year it was released. But it soon became clear that the MCU operates on comic book time. Basically, this means that time moves ahead in a way that's convenient for the stories Marvel wants to tell. One of the things we enjoy is seeing the Marvel world change over the years and hearing the constant stream of pop culture references, especially when Peter Parker's around. These references are fun, but also help remind us that these movies are taking place in a world and time period similar to our own. It's clear Marvel doesn't want to tie itself to specific years in order to allow its films more freedom. Still, these cultural references give us an idea of where in time our heroes are, while allowing them to grow, age, and evolve in a way that makes sense for their storylines. Plus, they're almost guaranteed to get a laugh from the audience whenever a character makes one. It's like how excited everyone gets when a character says the name of the movie. Oh, they did it! There it is! Yeah, that's... there it is. Ever since Tony Stark spilled the beans about being Iron Man, the average person in the MCU knows superheroes exist and that they walk among us. Everyone knows that. When Superman goes undercover as Clark Kent, he simply puts on a suit and a pair of glasses and the general public is none the wiser. But when it comes to the MCU, we don't exactly have a much more sophisticated system of hiding our heroes. All you need is a sweatshirt, a pair of sunglasses, a hat, and voila! You're totally incognito. Or at least that's what Marvel Studios wants you to think. Fans have even jokingly called this outfit the Civilian Starter Pack. It's kind of like the Marvel Studios version of plot armor. Even Marvel's in on the joke at this point. During Ant-Man and the Wasp, they make a joke about how ridiculous the idea is that superheroes could simply hide under a hat. Come on, Captain America is in public service announcements, but nobody notices him walking around in public as long as he has a hoodie on. It's pretty ridiculous, but it's the side of ridiculous we approve of. If our heroes couldn't walk down the street without being mobbed by fans, it'd seriously impact some of our favorite Marvel storylines. Yes, Tony Stark, we know you're Iron Man, but do you really need to be in so very many Marvel movies? We know, we know, 2008's Iron Man was the movie that kicked off the entire MCU, but at this point, Tony Stark showing up is just kind of expected. Of course, he's in all three movies in the Iron Man franchise, as well as the Avengers movies, but despite being called Captain America Civil War, Tony Stark's in the movie almost as much as the titular character. He even leads his own team of superheroes into battle and is involved in one of the most emotionally charged moments in the film. He also plays a massively important role in Spider-Man, and homecoming after recruiting Peter Parker in Civil War. Heck, he even makes an appearance in the 2008 movie Everyone Forgets the Incredible Hulk. Is that Ed Norton? What? While his fate in Avengers Endgame and beyond is uncertain at this moment, actor Robert Downey Jr. has said that he's open to doing another Iron Man movie. For a character that was originally designed to be unlikable, Tony Stark certainly is a fan favorite in the MCU. Could we really be saying goodbye to him for good during Endgame? Tell me it's not true! Many movies include a little something extra during or after the credits, but for Marvel movies, staying until the end is an absolute requirement. Not only are these scenes often amusing, but they provide crucial info on the MCU and upcoming movies. It may surprise you to know there are only two movies in the MCU which don't feature one of these Easter eggs. There was one plan for The Incredible Hulk, but it ended up getting included in the film itself. It was the scene with Tony Stark, which was originally going to be a bonus. In Captain America The First Avenger, we just got a teaser trailer for The Avengers, and Age of Ultron only had a mid-credits scene. 
see. Well, we're just spoiled at this point. Bucky Barnes, in particular, has had some important post-credit scenes. We learn that he went back into cryo sleep following the events of Civil War, and that he eventually ended up in Wakanda. During the post-credit scene of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, we finally got confirmation that Adam Warlock will be joining the MCU. Yay! Perhaps the most important scene of all was following Ant-Man and the Wasp, which saw Scott Lang trapped in the Quantum Realm. The implications of this and his appearance in the Endgame trailer launched too many fan theories to count. Everyone knows that Kevin Feige's a huge comic book nerd, but you might not be aware that he's also a huge Star Wars nerd as well. Aren't we all, really? One of the many patterns in the Star Wars franchise is characters losing their hands, and Marvel went through a phase where it couldn't get through a movie without someone losing a body part. It's not just any random phase, though. We're talking about Phase 2 specifically. Yes, all six movies in Marvel's Phase 2 involve someone losing either an arm or a hand. According to Kevin Feige, this isn't a coincidence and is a rather brutal way for him to pay tribute to one of his favorite franchises. In Iron Man 3, Aldrich Killian loses his arm during the final fight against Tony Stark. In Thor The Dark World, Thor appeared to lose his hand thanks to an illusion cast by Loki. Captain America The Winter Soldier includes a flashback where we see Bucky Barnes losing his arm when he falls off a train. Guardians of the Galaxy has a scene early on in the movie where Groot has both of his arms ripped off by Gamora. Ulysses Claw loses his arm to Ultron during Age of Ultron, and Yellow Jacket loses one arm before being sucked into the void of his shrinking suit. That's gotta hurt. Everyone knows being a superhero is a dangerous gig. Being willing to risk your own life to save people is part of the job description, and it's non-negotiable. But in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the only thing more dangerous than being a superhero is someone who mentors a hero. Seriously, the job security for these guys is just awful. Ho Yinsen saved Tony's life, providing him medical care, giving him lots to think about, and then was prominently taken out. Dr. Erskine's the man who caused Steve Rogers to go from someone the army wouldn't even take to the symbol of hope and freedom, known as Captain America. Oh, but yeah, Dr. Erskine didn't make it. The Ancient One taught Dr. Strange and who knows how many others how to master the mystic arts, and then she was destroyed. At least she had a good long run, though. Really long. During the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, Peter Quill thought the nicest thing Yondu had done for him was not eat him, and he frankly wasn't very appreciative. But after he realized Yondu was the father figure he had always wanted, or to be precise, his pappy, Yondu tragically perished. Odin and Zuri did their best to prepare Thor and T'Challa respectively to be king, but well, you can probably guess what happened to them too. There's no shortage of villains in the MCU, yet so many movies show our heroes fighting against one another. Of course, the most notable example of this is in Captain America Civil War. In that movie, we see teams of our favorite heroes in an all-out war with one another, but there are so many examples of this throughout the MCU. The Avengers have been sparring with each other ever since the Avengers, when Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor got into it. Then there are the various times the Hulk has turned against his fellow heroes. Scarlet Witch later turns the heroes against each other, which, again, causes Hulk to go on a rampage. Even the movie Ant-Man featured a show down between Scott Lang and Sam Wilson. We saw the Avengers perhaps irreparably fractured following Civil War, and Infinity War featured yet more hero-on-hero -hero action. When Star-Lord, Drax, and Mantis arrive on Titan, they initially start fighting against Iron Man, Spider-Man, and Doctor Strange. It's clear these guys are all about using fists first and asking questions later. A quick, hey, you guys with Thanos, could have cleared things up real quick. Although this is a common theme, we have to admit it's one which tends to resonate with Marvel audiences. We know superpowers and strength can be hard to quantify, but the superpowers of characters in the MCU tend to fluctuate wildly, even within the same movie. Instead of being held to a certain developed standard, each character seems to be as strong or as weak as they need to be in order to move the plot along. In Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Mantis puts Ego completely to sleep, but in Infinity War, she struggles to cause Thanos a few minutes of shut-eye. During the Winter Soldier, Captain America struggled to hold his own against Bucky's metal arm, but in Civil War, he's an even match for Spider-Man who had just stood up to the same arm. Then we see Bucky and Steve wailing on Tony's armor, despite the fact that even earlier versions of the Iron Man suit could withstand tanks and the God of Thunder. During Infinity War, Thanos takes down Thor, Loki, Heimdall, and scares the Hulk back into Bruce Banner. But later, we see the Mad Titan struggling against Iron Man and Doctor Strange with a much more full Infinity Gauntlet. Also later, Captain America is able to catch one of Thanos' punches in Wakanda. See, their power levels are all over the place. We do have to give credit where credit is due here, and Marvel Studios has greatly improved when it comes to showing female characters. But there's no denying it's been a very long and arduous journey to get here, and there are so many bad examples of poorly portrayed female characters in the MCU. Bruce Banner and Natasha Romanoff once bonded over feeling like monsters, Bruce because he turns into a literal monster, and Natasha because she's infertile. 
Yikes, not the most sensitive comparison, hmm? Even Mark Ruffalo, the actor who plays Bruce Banner, lamented that there was so little Black Widow merchandise available. She's one of the founding members of the Avengers, but few toys of her were released, and let's not even mention how long it's taken for her to get her own standalone movie. We're still keeping our fingers crossed this one actually ends up being released. Ant-Man and the Wasp was the 20th movie in the MCU lineup, and the very first one to feature a female hero with equal billing to a male hero. Black Panther did feature a ton of strong, capable, and well-rounded female characters, and we can't wait for Captain Marvel to be released. It's clear things are improving, and we're glad this pattern is on its way out. With few exceptions, romances in Marvel movies feel like they've been shoehorned in at the last possible moment. In The Avengers, it seemed like Black Widow and Hawkeye shared a history together, and the two appeared to be romantically linked to some extent. Oh, until Clint's wife showed up during Age of Ultron. Yeah, the guy had been married for years to a woman we barely got to meet. Her existence totally came out of left field for all of us, and made us wonder why Marvel had even bothered. Probably because that wood chopping scene, that was, that was a great scene. And then there's the relationship between Natasha Romanov and Bruce Banner, which also seemed to come out of nowhere and also went nowhere. Scott Lang and Hope Van Dyne ended up making out like a couple of teenagers after enjoying an adversarial relationship the whole movie. Oh, and then they apparently went on a break for years because Scott's involvement in Civil War. Then there's the awkward will they or won't they between Steve Rogers and Sharon Carter. And yes, Sharon Carter is the great niece of Steve's former girlfriend, Peggy Carter. It's not creepy. At least this odd MCU romance had a basis in the comic books, and we don't think we were alone in not being disappointed to learn Thor and Jane Foster broke up during Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, move on, Thor. You can do better, pal. In the world of TV and movie tropes, we have what's known as the Disney death, which is fitting since most of these movies have been made by Disney. This refers to the fact that, in many Disney movies, the hero appears to have perished and everyone cries, but then it turns out they're just fine. For quite a long time, Marvel movies took this trope pretty far, and it was honestly hard to take any deaths in the MCU seriously. Loki has died almost more times than we can count, and even his brother Thor seems to be tired of this trope. We've been made to believe Bucky Barnes was gone forever, and that Nick Fury didn't survive the events of Captain America the Winter Soldier. Whether or not Jarvis can really die might be debatable, but it turns out he was just fine, and it ended up becoming the Vision. Agent Phil Coulson was stabbed, Pepper Potts fell from a great height, and Janet Van Dyne went subatomic. You never go full subatomic, and yet, they were later revealed to be just fine. All these characters coming back to life, and Peter Parker's Aunt May is still single. What's that about, huh? Imagine how much more devastating the decimation would have been if we actually thought our heroes were gone for good. One of the most frequent themes explored by Marvel Studios is sibling rivalries. Not all of them are actual siblings, but the relationships are similar. In these rivalries, one sibling is good, the other is bad, and this causes no amount of fighting. Of course, we have the poster children for dysfunctional sibling relationships, Thor and Loki, but there are plenty more. Just look at Doctor Strange and Mordo, who both learn the mystic arts under the instruction of the Ancient One. And then we have the relationship between Gamora and Nebula, which took two movies to get anywhere close to a resolution, but in their defense, Thanos did pretty much everything possible to ensure they'd hate one another. Although they might not be related by blood, Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes grew up as brothers in every other sense of the word. Steve tried to follow Bucky into the army and later rescued him when he was brainwashed by Hydra. Hail Hydra. This may be a common Marvel dynamic, but it's a classic for a reason, and Marvel does do a remarkably good job of making us feel sympathetic for the bad sibling. This is the one trend we definitely don't see stopping anytime soon. Our Marvel heroes have amazing superpowers, high-tech gadgets, and impeccable senses of humor, but there's one thing they're sorely lacking, any type of foresight whatsoever. We've all made poor decisions that come back to bite us, but heroes in the MCU seem to do this with almost frustrating regularity. Tony Stark's definitely the worst in this respect. We suppose being a billionaire means you can get away without thinking about the consequence of your actions. He shut down his company during Iron Man without a second thought. He acted with abandon when struck with palladium poisoning, and we all know how well his Shatari cleanup went. That led to the situation where he ended up at a press release with no Spider-Man. Oh, and let's also not forget about how his experiments with artificial intelligence ended up. Not great. But let's not blame all this on Tony. Lack of foresight is one of Scott Lang's defining characteristics. We saw our heroes bring down S.H.I.E.L.D. entirely, which was devastating, and in many cases, deadly for existing agents. Yes, it did expose Hydra, and we hate to sound like Helmet Zemo here, but maybe they could have considered the consequences a little more first, hmm? Everyone knows that the events in the Marvel Cinematic Universe are all connected to one another, but we'll tell you about one character you may have missed. Everyone knows the late, great Stan Lee was the face of Marvel Comics, and we all looked forward to his cameos in every new movie. For a long time, there was a popular fan theory that Stan Lee was actually playing the same character in every single appearance. Eventually, this was confirmed by Marvel Studios head Kevin Feige, who says he loves the idea. Some fans even take this a step further and believe Stan Lee was portraying a comic book character known as Utaru the Watcher. This character is an alien who 
as the name implies, watches over major events in human history. It makes sense since Stan Lee does seem to have a knack for showing up to important events in the MCU. Many believe Stan Lee's cameo in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 confirms the idea that he was supposed to be Utaru. These cameos often added a bit of levity to his serious situation, and fans look forward to seeing them in each new movie. Moving forward without Stan Lee, we're really going to miss that moment in the movie theater when everyone cheers at the sight of him on the big screen. We love you, Stan! These are just a few of the many Marvel movie tropes we've come to know and love. Do you enjoy all of these tropes? Did we miss your favorite one? Tell us about it in the comments section below and don't forget to subscribe to CBR for more MCU videos. Thanks for watching.